Glass has a very long history. We know that people were making glass from about the 15th century BC. And for about the first 1500 years, they were making very small objects that were used in a luxury way. So they would make small jars for things like makeup and oils, small pieces that would be inlaid in furniture. So we're looking at some of the earliest glass vessels that were made. They are from Egypt. And these are vessels that we call core-formed because they were not blown, they were made in this process where you would use a central core of material, probably some dung or something organic, and you would wrap the glass around it. And then once it was cooled, you would pick that core out. That process actually really kind of demanded that the object be made very small. And objects like these would have been used to hold makeup or scented oils. It wasn't until about somewhere between 50 BC and 50 AD that somebody along the Levantine coast developed what we know today as glass blowing. And that really revolutionized and really changed glass making because now you could make things that were much larger, you could make a variety of shapes and sizes, you could use molds to make things that were consistently shaped as well. So this is a wonderful example of an early blown piece from the second century AD. And this really gives you a nice comparison between some of those early Egyptian vessels in terms of scale. So this piece is very large and it was blown by using a, a blowpipe and a maker dipping that blowpipe into molten glass and expanding it, blowing a bubble, expanding it, and then using tools to create the shape and then later adding the handles and creating a lid that would fit onto this object. Another technology that really changed the way we make glass actually happened here uh, in the United States um, in the early 19th century. And that was the development of what we call the glass press. This machine, which would have used some humans to press the glass, really changed our ability to make glass in terms of making it faster and making it honestly with a little less skill than a glass blower would have. So you could train somebody how to use this machine a lot faster than you could teach somebody how to be an expert glass blower. With a glass press, you need to have a mold. And so the mold maker is another person who has a lot of skill and the mold will allow you to create the shape of the glass and the decoration on the glass at the same time. So again, the, it speeds up the process because you don't have to have a separate skilled person who can cut the glass or engrave the glass or do whatever kind of decoration you want on the glass. In the second half of the 19th century, glass companies actually were moving into the Midwest to take advantage of natural resources like sand, and natural gas, which is specifically important to glass companies, and also to take advantage of space and transportation, the railroad, and workers that might be here as well. And there are hundreds of glass companies in this area. By the late 1880s, in the press, you could read about Toledo as the glass city. The studio art movement in glass is often talked about in terms of its origins here in Toledo, Ohio. In the mid 20th century, there wasn't anywhere you could go and take a class at a university in glass making. And there was a man named Harvey Littleton who was teaching ceramics here at the Toledo Museum of Art. And he had wanted to hold a workshop where artists could come in and experiment with the material. So Otto Whitman, the director then at the museum, gave him some space here on our campus. Harvey invited a number of people, ceramics professors from around the country to come. They built a furnace with the help of a local retired scientist, Dominic Labino. And this group of people came together in 1962 and just began to experiment with the material. And this is really this watershed moment where experimentation with glass as a material for art making really begins here in the United States. So here's a work by Dominic Labino called Vitrana. It's made up of 33 panels of glass that are cast. He was a scientist at a factory called John's Manville, a fiberglass factory. 
And when he retired, he started a second career as an artist making glass. And he's really important also to kind of understanding how experimental people were being with glass in the 1960s and 70s. It really just shows you how interested he was in color and that idea of working with his knowledge of chemistry into his artwork. And the color in glass is really all about the chemistry. So you put different minerals in the glass and you get different colors. A really simple example of that is something like cobalt. So cobalt makes a blue glass. Green and yellow can result from the presence of copper in glass. You can get red from using gold in glass. And so understanding the chemistry then becomes vital to getting the color of glass that you want. I think people are really drawn to glass. It really is a material that just does things that no other material does. Whether it's wanting to pick up that beautiful stemmed goblet and have a glass of wine out of it, or whether it's wanting to have a big window in your kitchen so that you can look out and see the world, or whether it's driving your car and having this material that allows you to travel in the way that we do today, or whether it's picking up your phone and looking at the screen. Artists love what it does with light, and we love what it does maybe in just facilitating our daily lives.